Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our lunchtime talk today. Um, thanks for joining us. It's, uh, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Griswold Center for Economic Policy Studies, Judith Rabinovitz Center for Public Policy and Finance, and the Economic History Group here at Princeton. Um, it's a really great honor to introduce today uh, Brad DeLong for today's book talk, um, talking about his latest work, Slouching Towards Utopia. As you all know, uh, Brad is a professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and the influential writer of the Substack blog, uh, Grasping Reality. Uh, he's written widely in a number of different areas of economics, including in particular, uh, extremely influential research on economic growth and the role of machinery and equipment in the growth process. Um, Slouching Utopia is a panoramic view of economic growth around the world, in particular of the unprecedented explosion of material wealth in the decades since 1870, how it's transformed the world we all live in, and why in many ways it still failed to, to deliver uh, the utopia that some people were, were maybe anticipating. Um, it's been described uh, by Paul Krugman as a magisterial history um, and was named a best book of 2022 uh, by the Financial Times. And so I know that I speak for all of us when I say that we're really excited to learn more about the book uh, from Brad today. And Brad, it's a great honor and privilege to hand the floor over to you. Brad's going to aim to talk for about 30 minutes, um, you know, clarifying questions during, and then we'll have some time at the end uh, for further questions and discussion. Uh, thanks very much, Brad. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. And as always happens when I come into this building, the first thing that happens is I get completely and totally lost. <laughs> so I think it is in some ways a miracle that I have actually managed to get here um, on time and I'm able to speak. Let me... Um, I suppose what I should start by doing is saying that I have written a very big book. Um, I have written a 600-page book, which is kind of scary, especially when I consider that there are another 400 pages in draft on the cutting room floor, and then there are notes and quotations and outlines for another 400 pages more. Um, but I decided I thought this book really did deserve a mass market publisher, and so I should go for basic, and, you know, I am... Actually, basic, basic sweet spot is the 300 page. Um, and it's still a miracle to me. I managed to get them to publish a 600 page book. Um, they thought they would say, go to a university press, you long-winded professor, and publish it in three volumes. But I did persuade them that a 600 page book was worth publishing under the basic imprint. And we now appear to be at 38,000 copies, sold all formats worldwide. And I'm counting on you to push that over 40,000 in the next month. So you have your marching orders. Um, as to why I wrote this book, um, I wrote it, right? I wrote it because I thought somebody should write it. I thought it was time that we actually did try to get a grand narrative of what had really happened in economic history. Um, in economic history since the invention of agriculture. You know, and no one else was writing it. And I became more and more convinced as I grew older that the place to start in it was in thinking that, you know, 1870 was the real hinge of history, rather than any of the other dates proposed. Um, and then in the early 1990s, you know, I read Eric Hobsbawm's, the fourth volume of his three-volume 19th century trilogy, the fourth volume being 1914 to 1990, what he called the Age of Extremes, and then at the Harvard Economic History Lunch on Fridays, I would carp and grumble about how he'd done it wrong. Um, how he'd written a book, the, uh, the Age of Extremes, in which you know, the central thing happening in the 20th century was world communism, which was a tragic hero. You know, fatally flawed by the circumstances of its birth and in the end expiring in a low dishonest way at the end of the 1980s. But before it expired, you know, saving the world from Nazism, but in the process empowering the bad neoliberals, who while not the worst guys were bad guys and who had foreclosed any possibilities that you know, the world would actually achieve something called unity. Um, 
And so I said, that's the wrong story to tell. You know, that's not the big story of what's happened to humanity over economic history or even in the 20th century. You know, to which David Landis and Jeffrey Williamson and Claudia Golden and you know, Peter Temin said, well, why don't you write the book? And I said, I'm not qualified. Uh, 1998 comes around, and I say, hmm, no one else is writing it. So I wrote a chapter and set a stake as this is something I might want to do. I didn't. Ten years later, Tim Sullivan of Basic Books comes around and says, you ought to be writing this. You're not. Let's put you under contract. And then I can come around once a year and yell at you about how there's been no progress on the manuscript. And I say, OK. Then 10 more years pass. You know, and then I finally settle down, write it. Um, and here it is. And I guess the big place to start saying why this particular book needs to be written is to start with our hopelessly inadequate guesses. Um, about the broad shape of world economic history you know, since the really old days. Um, since the days back in, say, 75,000 years ago, when there really were only maybe um, 5,000 of us. Um, or at least 5,000 of us from whom almost all of us have almost all of our heredity hanging out um, somewhere in East Africa, the last group of East African plains apes, and how we then spread over the world, and then about 10,000 years ago, we developed agriculture. And back then, there were maybe, maybe 2 million, maybe 5 million of us, um, and once we develop agriculture, we seem to immediately shorten, on average, by three inches, at least according to all the femurs that we have managed to dig up, um, suggesting that you know, life as an agriculturalist you know, was significantly easier than life as a gatherer hunter, um, that it's not nearly as strenuous and stressful if you have to be carrying your babies around all the time, as opposed to just plopping down and waiting for the seeds to grow in the well-irrigated land. Um, and so with a much easier lifestyle, well, population expands. But as population expands, nutritional standards decline. Um, and as nutritional standards decline, it looks like people got significantly shorter, right? three to four inches shorter. Adult males who are not 5'9", but instead 5'5 five five or so. And I'm not sure about New Jersey right now, but in California, you know, if I'd fed my children a diet that would have given the males an expected adult height of 5'5", five five inches, Alameda County Child and Protective Services would have come and taken my children away. And I would not have seen them again. Um, that administering enormous, in the long run, nutritional insults to children is not what parents are about. And yet the fact that that seems to have been what life was like back, for at least from the femurs we've managed to dig up from agriculturalists. That and the fact that the upper classes really do seem to be two inches taller than the rest of the people. They really do seem to be high and mighty seems to tell us that once you get people herded onto the farms and into agriculture, that it's quite dire as far as poverty is concerned for the typical person. You know, if it weren't, people would be feeding their children better. Um, and we look at rates of population growth, right? That 5 million people, maybe, in minus 6,000. Um, 500 million people, seven and a half millennia, millennia later, you know, um, hundredfold population growth over seven and a half millennia, um, a hundred, you know, say two to the sixth is 64, two to the seventh is 128, so a hundred is approximately seven doublings, seven doublings over seven millennia, that's a doubling every thousand years. You know, a doubling is 0.7 in the log, so 0.7 divided by 1,000 you know, gives you 0.007 or 0.07% per year as your population growth 
rate. Um, that's an average population growth rate of, you know, maybe 1% a generation or so. And yet we know that a nutritionally unstressed human population, like my Puritan settler ancestors in Massachusetts, um, that it will quadruple from natural increase in a century. Um, and yet we don't see that. Instead, we see extraordinarily low rates of population increase. And it's not because fertility is low. It really does look like in the long agrarian age, you know, the typical woman's experience um, is something like nine children and maybe seven live births or very late miscarriages. You know, but 50% infant mortality, three and a half children or so surviving to five. And so barely two surviving to reproduce, um, spending, what, say nine with an average seven, spending five years pregnant, and then for 15 years someone is breastfeeding, um, spending 20 years carrying the nutritional load of having to eat for two, genuinely. And, you know, one in seven of English queens between William the Conqueror and Queen Victoria die in childbed. You know, and it's unlikely that that's a population less subject to childbed mortality risk than your typical human population. Um, and, you know, that's pretty horrific. And also, it has the consequence, well, you know, if you have two, if, if population growth rates are very low, so that two children um, grow up for each couple um, to reproduce, um, well, Poisson distribution, right? Um, only one-ninth chance you don't, you have any children, but there's a one-third chance you don't have a surviving son. And if you think you're in a world of high patriarchy, then if you reach middle age as a woman and if you have no surviving son, you are not socially dead, but you are not that far away um, from being socially dead. You have relatively little status and few people who will advocate for you. And those who are really will want you to take on a very subservient position in their household. You know, hence the Malthusian population equilibrium. Um, you know, when you get extra resources, using them to try to diminish that one chance in three that you are not going to have a surviving son if you're lucky enough to make it to late middle age is going to be a very powerful force driving human behavior. And so whenever, um, whenever technology advances, instead of using better technology to deliver a higher standard of living, um, well, it's going to be devoted to trying to, to reduce the risks that your generation has, fails to have surviving sons. And so technological improvement is going to be offset by greater resource scarcity, you know, created by smaller farm sizes. You know, as your population grows from the 5 million of minus 6,000 on up to the 500 million, you have 1,500 with wonderful, wonderful, wonderful better technology. But with, as best we can tell, not that much difference in terms of standards of living. Um, and furthermore, um, if you're in a world in which Malthusian forces are going to keep humanity from being able to bake a sufficiently large economic pie for everyone to have enough, you know, then how are you going to get enough? Um, or how are you going to try? Well, one thing you can do is you can try to become extraordinarily productive yourself. The problem is that's very hard, and that also makes you a very soft target for people who are pursuing a different strategy, for people who are deciding it's time to join a gang, right? to become a thug with a spear, or later a thug with a gunpowder weapon. Um, or better yet, someone who manages to have some authority over and boss around um, gangs of thugs with spears. And if your hand-eye coordination is not that great, um, and if you're not well that well nourished, um, but if you're relatively clever, well, at least you can become one of their tame accountants, propagandists, um, and bureaucrats. Um, 
And so that seems to be a lot of what human life was like um, from the invention of agriculture. You know, on a, you know, I would say, you know, to 1870. Um, if we want to, if you want to dress it up in an economic growth model, we can say that output per worker is capital intensity raised to the salience of capital theta times the efficiency of labor. We can say that the efficiency of labor depends on the value of the ideas stock times a resource scarcity term. And we can say that capital intensity is our old solo, right? The savings rate over the sum of the population growth rate, the efficiency of labor growth rate, and the depreciation rate. And we can use that to unwind um, an estimate worldwide of what the value of the stock of human ideas um, is that has been discovered, developed, deployed, and then diffused throughout um, the world economy. <coughs> Do that, take that seriously, um, normalize the ideas stock in 1870 you know, to be equal to one, and we can say that technological development did truly wonderful things from the invention of agriculture on up to 1870. You know, a 0.4 to one, a 25-fold increase in the value of the stock of useful human ideas for manipulating nature and for productively organizing humans. Um, but the force and fraud exploitation and domination gangs and the fact that Malthusian pressure is pushing population up and so increasing resource scarcity means all of that does little, um, does very little to change um, the way that human beings typically manage to live. And then just do the numbers after 1870. Um, our technology level in 2010, it stood at 20 according to this very crude measure. It's now up to something like 25 or so. Our rates of technology growth are now 2% per year and have been since 1870. In contrast to 0.05% per year back you know, before 1500. Um, the period of transition between 1500 and 1870, you know, it sees somewhat faster growth in technology, but not fast enough to plausibly exceed um, Malthusian right, growth rates that can be countered by Malthusian pressures pushing up population. Um, you don't need that much of a population explosion to offset growth e technology growth even at the Industrial Revolution century pace of less than half a percent. But since 1870, you know, we get in two years as much increase in technology as people back before 1500 worldwide saw in a century. You know, and that's the big thing about the 20th century starting in 1870. And that's what makes it the hinge of history. You know, and that may well be an underestimate. Right? That, um, here on the left, we have the richest private citizen, at least, who had ever lived before 1850, Nathan Mayer Rothschild, the head of the British branch of the Rothschild Bank. On the top right, we have a penicillium mold growing in a petri dish. On the bottom right, we have a model of the penicillin molecule. You know, if you want to be truly horrified, um, read Neil Ferguson's biography of the Rothschild dynasty. The pages in which he described how Nathan Mayer Rothschild in his early 50s was tortured for months by German doctors. Was tortured for months because he had an infected abscess in his butt um, from which he died. And so never got to see his grandchildren um, grow up. Um, all the wealth a private citizen could have in the world and yet before 1850, hell, before 1930, it could not purchase you know, a single penicillin molecule. Um, if one of us gets such things, we go down to university health services, we probably certainly do not get to see a doctor. We almost surely do not get to see a nurse practitioner. At the most, we get to see an orderly. 
you know, and they drain, they lance it, they drain it, they slap some antibiotic powder in it, they slap a bandage on it, they yell at us for having it, let it get so bad before we came in, and then they send us off saying, come back in two days if the redness isn't gone. Are all of us significantly richer in what really matters for human well-being than Nathan Mayer Rothschild? Um, you know, um, by some measures, almost surely yes. You know, is then saying that the value of our technology stock is only 20 times what it was in 1870? Is that a gross underestimate? You know, from one perspective, um, from one perspective, almost surely yes. You know, and it is this rocketing up of technology since 1870 that is the truly big underlying thing you know, making history since 1870 very different from history before 1870. When you had the background Malthusian slow technology growth, slow population growth, you know, force and fraud exploitation gangs trying to elbow other competitors out of the way and also building a high culture form of history. That was the way that things worked, um, was the way that things worked back before then. You know, um, and so we would think that the history of what's happened since 1870, um, it really should be quite utopian, right? We have extraordinary technological powers that have been produced by our finally finding an institutional sweet spot in which the pace of growth of human technology is not 5% per century but instead 2% per year. Um, and yet, when we look at the world around us, um, <clears throat> not so. Right? It seems that we have reached a, a stage where we are rapidly approaching a situation in which we, have, so we are easily able to bake a sufficiently large economic pie for everyone to have enough at least by any standard of enough that would have been recognized by any previous century. You know, and baking the economic pie was supposed to be the hard part. You know, that once you have a sufficiently large economic pie, that there is enough that you do not really need to run the force and fraud exploitation and domination games in order that your children have enough food to grow tall, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that once you've figured out how to bake a sufficiently large economic pie, then slicing and tasting the economic pie, um, equitably distributing it, and then utilizing our wealth wisely and well so that we feel safe and secure and are healthy and happy. Those would seem to be somewhat easier jobs than figuring out how to actually tickle atoms and energy and how to arrange ourselves productively. You know, and yet not. Um, that a world in which civilization's relative income levels were, say, within a band of three in terms of how much richer the richest civilization areas, ethnic areas, national areas were over the poorest back in 1800 is now in which it's more like 20. Um, that certainly up to 1975, we saw a world of extraordinary divergence, you know, where the global north, which was maybe 30% richer than the global south in 1800, was twice as rich as the global south in 1870, and then four and a half times richer than the global south from um, 1975. And since then, things look much, much better on a per person level. But you know, that's because India and China um, have done extraordinarily well over the past generation and a half. And if you view the right forecast for the future as being not a per person, but instead a per nation thing, that each nation is in some sense has an institutional draw from some underlying distribution. The fact that India and China have done very well does not um, make you optimistic for the future because those were two lucky draws that turned out to be very important indeed because they were 40% of humanity. You know, it's not that peep, there are many people in the world today who are as poor as our pre-industrial ancestors were in 1800 or 1870. Maybe 
Maybe only the bottom 400 million are at kind of the dire poverty stage in which most of our peasant and craftsman ancestors lived before 1800, only 5%. Um, and even for those 5%, they have some access to the village cell phone. You know, and they also have life expectancies at birth more than 60, you know, compared to the 30 of our pre-industrial <clears throat> ancestors. You know, that somehow we've managed to be able to successfully distribute our public health technology around the world to an extraordinarily good extent. Even while the technologies to actually make people productive in the sense our technology allows, you know, their distribution is still extraordinarily unequal. You know, what? Not that people are poorer than they used to be, but there's this hideous waste of distributional opportunity, our failure to push the whole world toward modernity. Um, that's kind of scary. Um, and, you know, there's also... Um, <coughs> The fact that the force and fraud domination and exploitation game still appears to be going on. You know, that you can understand an Aristotle back in minus 350, you know, saying that there are four branches of economics, four branches of the science of acquisition. You know, and the least important of them is knowledge of technologies and market conditions. And the next to least important is figuring out how to boss your wife around. And the second most important is figuring out how to raise your children well. Um, and the most important is how to boss your slaves. Because if you do not have slaves, you will not be able to have enough leisure time and will not be well enough nourished to actually live the life of a philosopher or even of a good citizen, um, a good middle or upper class citizen you know, of a Greek citizen. You know, hence Aristotle writes in his politics you know, that you know, masters are going to want and need slaves and lots of them. And this is how things are going to be because we lack um, the robot blacksmiths that the mythical craftsman Daedalus impose, um, you know, employed in order to make his works. Or the self-propelled catering carts, autonomous catering carts that the smith god Hephaestus um, built for the gods so that when they were dining in Olympus, reclining on their couches, the dining room of Olympus was not polluted with lesser beings coming into their assembly, but instead you just had these robotic tripod three-legged catering carts coming in bringing the food. Um, that's actually what Hephaestus is making in the Iliad when Achilles' mother, the nymph, the nymph Thetis, comes to him saying that Hector has managed to capture my son Achilles' armor and he's a whole new set. And of course then Hephaestus gives up working on this you know, technological giga and goes to making very important things. You know, spears and shields and helmets and armor. And so, um, you know, that the force and fraud domination machine is there and still, and a lot of people are very, very upset. Um, both that they have too little, that they have less than they deserve, and often to a remarkable degree that other people have much more than they deserve. And that is a very personal insult. You know, um, the standard example I use is the kind of person in right, working for an Obama era or funded by an Obama era um, manufacturing employment training program in Oklahoma who was utterly distressed at the fact that Trump was cutting it back on the ground that it was going to losers and moochers, which he said he was not. That instead, he said, Obama should go to Oklahoma City and take, it'll take away the Obama phones from the ghetto dwellers um, who were unworthy and who were getting, you know, something. Um, it's the attitude of, say, you know, Mitt Romney, who is a good man um, and who is my 53rd favorite senator out of 100. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, getting hopelessly confused in front of a Florida audience of donors. And instead of saying the Democratic base is 47% of the electorate, and so I have to win, you know, 51 of the 53 remaining, so you need to give all my money. 
Um, instead, he hits the 47% number, and then half remembers a misleading briefing he was given by AEI's Nick Everstadt, and says those 47% pay no income tax, and so do not feel the effect of government spending, of governments capturing resources from its spending from the productive private economy, and they are used to getting something for nothing, and so I can't care about them because I'll never be able to convince them to take responsibility for their lives. You know, that that framework continues. Um, you know, if I, were, um, if I were sitting in the Kremlin and if I wanted to convince the Ukrainians that they were merely, say, or not merely, if that they were a, a fellow ethnicity of Russia, of great Russia, smaller in numbers than the great Russians, but, you know, of equal status and all part of our common Russian heritage and all. I would be spending money like water training troops, touring troops of the Bolshoi Ballet and sending them off to Ukraine. I would be paying poets to go and read the works of Pushkin aloud in Ukrainian town squares. I would not be sending killer robots overhead to blow things up. Um, yet somehow this is the world, um, you know, this is the world that we've wound up with. And it's one in which we are not at all clear, um, not at all clear, you know, how it's going to be that we can successfully, you know, figure out how to distribute the technologies that we know very, very well to the very large places of the world, which are now still 50, 100 years behind in terms of potential productive technology. And, um... The question is, why are we in this fix still? You know, why have the problems of slicing and tasting? You know, the economic pie proven to be so much more difficult than the problem of figuring out how to bake a sufficiently large one. You know, now for here, um, taking off from Amartya Sen, who I think still has my copy of Karl Polanyi's Trade and Market in the Early Empires book. At least I remember him borrowing it from me back two and a half decades ago, and I have never been able to find it since. Um, I may be libeling him, but I still think he has it. Um, and, um, you know, um, Amartya's view, as we all know, is that markets respond not to human utility, but to effective demand, and effective demand is roughly intensity of need times wealth. Um, and if you don't have market demand, well then, you know, the, the market will, if it, everything is working well, it will maximize its own social welfare function, and its own social welfare function will be a weighted sum of individual utilities. And if you have you know, wealth, the, your weight in the mark social welfare function the market maximizes is zero. You know, the market literally does not care whether you live or die. You know, the two and a half million people dead in the Bengal famine of 1942 and 1943 were dead in a Pareto optimal way because they had no wealth and they had no wealth because the plantations of Bengal had been closed down because the Japanese carrier striking force, Kido Butai, was seen off on the coast of Ceylon and hence no employment for people producing export staples in Bengal in 1942 and 43, and two and a half million dead. That underlying our enormous prosperity is the market economy. And you know, the market economy is an absolutely wonderful thing in very many dimensions. Friedrich von Hayek, I think, is my favorite theorist of it as a way of crowdsourcing solutions to the social problem of production. Uh, that all of you know that in whatever bureaucracy you're enmeshed, if you follow bureaucratic procedures, you only deal satisfactorily with one-third of the cases. And if you actually follow the rules, the other two-thirds of the cases are highly suboptimal. And centrally command and control systems are worse, where there's someone who really does think that he is a boss and that they, you, are their robot to do what he demands. Well, he has little clue about what things are actually like. Um, and so you spend most of your time evading them. But a well-functioning market, you know, if you can properly tune market prices to reflect social values, 
Um, and if you can assign private property to people, then people out at the periphery where the information is can actually make decisions as to how to use resources productively. And provided prices are properly tuned to social values, you know, that, um, that tuning will then also provide them with a huge incentive in order to do good you know, for humanity, for the world, to appropriately use resources. Um, you know, and that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. The problem is it comes at the price of the fact that the only rights the market vindicates are property rights. And so the only people um, whose desires the market satisfies are those who are rich because they were lucky and own property that is useful in producing things for which the current rich have a serious job. And that is not what anyone thinks a good society should be. You know, Friedrich von Hayek's attitude toward this, and the part of him I like less, and the part of him I think is the Mr. Hyde to the Dr. Jekyll theorist of the market as crowdsourcing device. You know, Friedrich Hayek's view was always tough. Yes, it's incredibly unfair. Yes, there is no such thing as social justice. A market cannot produce it. But a market cannot produce pro can produce prosperity. And we monkey with the market at our great peril. So what we really should do is shut up, sit down, and recognize that the only, um, that the only scripture we can afford to recognize, um, to follow, is the market giveth, the market taketh away. Uh, blessed be the name of the market. Um, but as Karl Polanyi pointed out, that simply does not work as an empirical matter. You know, that people have enormous demands that they have rights that society vindicate, even if the market does not. And if the market attempts to abolish all of those other rights that people think they have, society will respond. And society will respond by trying to figure out a way in which it can properly curb and discipline um, the market. Over the course of the past 140 years, the 2% per year rate of average technology growth we've had means that every single generation human technological competence has doubled. Which means that every single generation we have had a underlying technical hardware structure for the economy that's very different from what it was a generation before. Which means that every year we have had to try to figure out a way to rejigger the the econo, sociological, political, cultural software of society, so that it fits with the changed hardware so that it does not crash. As we've gone from steam power to applied science to mass production to global value chain and now into info biotech society. But, you know, figuring out how to rewrite the software of society in 40 years with no previous models under immense time pressure with this enormous tension between our need to and our distaste for the market, that's a fairly hard job at which we have been, by and large, unsuccessful over the past 40 years. Um, and, you know, that, um, that really is my book. Um, that, my book is our story of how we tried to rewrite that econo-sociological political software over and over again, over the 140 years starting in 1870, and how we by and large failed, how we managed to produce a world in which, yes, we are at best slouching towards utopia, in which we are very rapidly drawing nearer to, and in fact exceeding previous definitions of what would be an economy productive enough to have enough for everyone and yet repeatedly failed in figuring out how to slice and taste the economic pie, how to distribute it equitably, and then use it wisely and well. And, you know, I've been living with these ideas for a very long time with now, and I'm bored with hearing myself talk. I'm interested in hearing you say what I've gotten big time wrong in this story. <laughs> Thank you.
welcome. We've got some time for questions. I, I've got some questions for other people the way you're collecting your thoughts. I just want to ask a little bit about the turning point in 1870. Yeah. So, and as you discussed, in principle, one could think about other points of being British, obviously, sort of 1760 in the Industrial Revolution is sort of one that comes to mind. And 1689, 1689, you're right, Doug North was always beating the drum of 1689 to the day he died, and I'm sure is beating the drum for 1689 uh, up now. There's, you know, 1520 and the Reformation. Um, there's, you know, some other people say it's really 1610, and we're in, Sir Edward Coke decides the common law is a useful thing he can use to constrain an alien Scottish monarch. Um, and so you truly get the establishment of a legal framework, even if not of parliamentary supremacy. Um, you can go further back. David Hurley he thought it was the Black Death and the change in European social structures that happened as a result of the Black Death that set us the European marriage pattern and such that created the situation in which there was a durable middle class with enough surplus. Um, you can go back earlier, you can go back all the way to, say, the fight between church and emperor in medieval Germany, 1070, Emperor Heinrich IV Salier at the castle of Canossa, begging for absolution for the pope and the establishment of the principle that the rule of law binds even the most powerful rather than being their tool. Um, over at Harvard, you know, Joseph Hinrich continues to say that it's actually what really matters is in 600 AD, the decision of the Western Christian Church, that it is going to act like a cult and attempt to break down every single clan tie it can find. That what it wants is it wants people to be focused not on their extended families, but instead on the church, the priest, the congregation, and God. And in destroying clan networks, you create a situation in which everyone has to trust has to establish a very weak tie, very wide-ranging economic network of counterparties rather than just staying within the clan and either robbing or killing everyone else. And it's that kind of diffuse sociology that makes modern civilization, the rich countries of modern civilization, so weird, is Joseph's acronym and was the real cause. Yes. So lots of possibilities. Yes. Question at the back over here. I, I have two questions. If, yeah. let's say, slouching toward utopia and we didn't hit utopia. Let's say we actually, today, you were speaking to us and you said, we have hit utopia. What would be the measures that would define that? And then stepping back or forward to the con kind of mess that we're dealing with right now in terms of geopolitical... Uh, well, there are a bunch. You know, people with spears. What, where do you think we are now in the, in the evolution of the kind of the history that you outlined? Well, you know, at, at one level, I'd say no killer robots would be a good, um, a good gauge. If he had no killer robots, we'd be happy. Um, you know, it's, there are a bunch of things you want, boxes you want to check off, right? Um, life expectancy at birth greater than 30, you'd want to check off that. Um, you know, sufficient prenatal and neonatal and subsequent nutrition that adult males average something like 5 foot 9 or 5 foot 10. You want to check that off. You know, infant mortality well below 50%. Um, lifetime female childbed mortality below 14%, well below 14%. You'd want that. Back when I was, just after I was born, um, in the early 1960s, my, um, my mother carried me up the... God, how old was she then? Um, born my great-grandmother, um, Eleanor... Lawson Carter Lord, born in 1877, um, in Radcliffe's first graduating class in 1899, so she must have been 83, 84, um, living in a fourth floor walk-up building on Commonwealth Avenue, a block from Boston's Public Garden. You know, my mother carries me up, introduces her to her first great-grandchild, and her first question is, how many teeth did you lose during pregnancy? You know, and this is an upper-class Bostonian from the late 19th century, you know, a woman who was used to having considerable social power, right? that um, you know, has an FBI record for the four communist front organizations she belonged to after World War II, and someone who swam the Hellespont um, in her, I think, late 50s after World War II as well, and yet she assumes that female nutritional standards are sufficiently poor that 
you know, you, lose, you can lose a tooth during pregnancy, um, simply because there's not enough calcium in the system. You know, avoiding that. Um, jobs in which we're not, jobs in which our brains are actually used well, rather than ones in which we are used as microcontrollers for machines or as, you know, low-level information processors um, in which we're sorting things into boxes that don't actually consume the full brain power of the East African planes they has available. Um, and then there are the questions about what a utopia really looks like in terms of social organization, right? Do we want... Do we want a... Do we want a Sparta? Do we want a Rome? Do we want an Athens? Um, do we want a Sybaris? Do we want an Arcadia? Um, or do we actually think we can get a Jerusalem um, of some form or other? You know, that is, do we want to direct an immediate knowledge of the good thing, of the, of the goods, of the good of the universe? Um, do we want just an organized society that works together? Do we want a powerful society? Do we want a society of debate and discussion and argument and intellectual ferment? Um, do we want a society of unbelievable luxury? Do we want a society of kind of simplicity and comfort? You know, and, ease? and indeed, the fact that we are finding it so difficult to decide may mean that we shouldn't be surprised that we haven't managed to figure out what to do with the minor problem of rewriting our software to conform to our technological heart. Any other questions? Uh, Michael? Michael? Yeah, uh, Brad, um, so the question is, like, what, what does history tell us about how countries can grow up and become advanced countries? I mean, it, it, there are very few, really, when you look at the whole world that we will call advanced countries. And, and if you look at the last... 30 or 40 years, only a few have graduated. So what is the thing that seems to be coming from what we know of history that could be a lesson for that transition? Um, graduated in the sense of managing to make sufficient use of technological possibilities of the global technological commons that they become significantly rich. Um, or graduated in the sense that their politics seems, you know, kind of unproblematic and rational. At that, the second one. Yes. Well, the second is very contested. Right? I have <clears throat> large numbers of Chinese students who will tell me that no, Xi Jinping is an authoritarian boss who thinks he knows best, uh, but at least he's competent and listens to advisors. You know, as opposed to, you know, an America or a Britain that can throw up God knows who, who is radically unqualified to be president or to make decisions. Um, someone like Donald Trump, who would unilaterally disarm himself of his leverage in terms of fighting a trade war with China by blowing up the Trans-Pacific Partnership on day one of his administration, and then say, I'm going to launch the trade war anyway, because they're popular and easy to win and leave the Chinese thinking for three years it's just a bluff, because if he actually were serious about any of these things, he would have done the TPP, and then we'd be facing a united front of 13 countries behind the U.S. negotiating position rather than the U.S. alone. You know, or Boris Johnson, who wanted to be fight strongly for the little people of Britain against the Eurocrat menace, so that he could establish himself as the only leader of the Conservative Party who actually cared about the little middle-class people of Britain as opposed to the plutocrats of London and the cosmopolites, and then astonishingly found that he'd actually won the Brexit vote and then had absolutely no idea what to do thereafter. That um, our Chinese students are very, very strong on this, that, you know, um, that basically when Madison and Hamilton said that previous experience with democracy showed that it really was a shit show that you should avoid, but that there had been improvements in the science of government since ancient times and we should give it a try, that when Madison and Hamilton wrote that in the Federalist Papers, they were wrong. Um, and, you know, that's one thing that is live right now. 
you know, there are people like Frank Fukuyama who are making desperate attempts to say, no, it's actually not that bad at all, that liberal democracy is the best system, and we can demonstrate that in the next generation, but indeed we do have to demonstrate that. So that the problem of getting a sustainable and a good political order up and running is proving to be more difficult in the past decade than any of us thought it was going to be. In any ways, the problem of, you know, um, the problem of technology um, is in some ways easier. We simply need to have a, you know, as Bob Allen said, for the 19th century, what you need, you need our banks, um, what you need is schools, what you need our infrastructure, and what you need is you need a government that is willing to figure out where are you likely to build, to establish a durable comparative advantage, and how do we build the communities of engineering practice to nurture those? And if your government can figure out how to build those communities of engineering practice with those enormous externalities, you know, then it happens, whether in southern Europe after World War II or in East Asia. Um, but, you know, the government has to be actually interested in economic development and clued in as to how to make it happen. It has to be embedded and autonomous. Um, and for there, the big lesson of history is that you do not want to have a plutocratic, usually a landlord plutocratic um, class with enormous influence over the government. You know, because the big difference between East Asia and Latin America appears to be that in Latin America, the bureaucrats are the children and the relatives of the landlords. While in East Asia, either the Japanese, the Chinese, the Chinese communists, the Chinese nationalists, the Russians, the North Koreans, someone had gotten rid of all the landlords uh, before the bureaucracy could take hold and start trying to construct um, a state for economic. Any questions, uh, um, gentlemen at the front here? Yes. <clears throat> if I'm uh, trying to understand, you start with this graph with the equations, the principal went to wide income, and uh, then a lot of associated uh, equations. Then there's a few graphs later, you have this um, progress, I don't know what, that's not a word, it's between India, US, at the lower left corner, back 18 something, and then, yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do we uh, reconcile what's in here? There's an enormous time difference involved. And what you said in the first slide, I mean, wh what can we take home and say, wow, this is so consistent with one another? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat, could you sharpen the question? Oh, the, the question is that yeah. is a, here yes. one gets the impression that something India got it right has gotten it right since 1985. I mean, yes. whatever it is. Has gotten it much more right since 1985 than before. Yeah. Yes. That the British Raj was profoundly uninterested in the economic development of India, and that showed. Even though Karl Marx in 1850 said they may not be interested in economic development, but economic, the British Raj may not be interested in economic development. But economic development is very interested in the British Raj. The British are building railroads across India for purposes of military control and for purposes of selling goods into the Indian market. You know, but railroads, you need railroad engineers to repair them. And once you start getting engineers and once other people start using the market, well, then Karl Marx expected India to be rich and independent by 1900. Um, simply because the logic of economic development pushed by the import of modern technology into India would push it forward. Yep. He was wrong. Um, India in 1947, by and large, doesn't look much richer than in 1800. And then India in 1985 doesn't look much richer than it was in 1947, <coughs> even though the Congress Party had taken what they thought was the... Um, most sophisticated and accurate kind of model for running a modern economy that they could find. You know, the one they inherited from their British Labour Party allies as to how you should establish an economy in order to push it forward. You know, that is nationalize the commanding heights so that the commanding heights could supply services to the rest of the economy, 
focus on regional development, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And what worked relatively badly for Britain in the post-World War II generation became irredeemably corrupt and extremely destructive as a blockage of Indian development. Up until 1985, when Rajiv Gandhi takes over and says it's time to start something new, it's time to move India in at least somewhat neoliberal direction and start dismantling the license range. You know, um, then, you know, in, in compared to everything that happened before 1985, India since has done so much that is so absolutely excellent and wonderful. If you accept the fact that its current government seems to be a, I would say, more than flirting with national Hinduism um, and seems to want to cast India's Muslims into the role as people who really don't belong here in which European countries traditionally cast the Jews. That's very worse. But in terms of economic development, the time since 1985 has been very good. I mean, we're getting short on time, but let me collect a few questions. The gentleman at the back right, yes. and I think the young lady here has one. So just collect, collect them together, and then Brad can respond okay. to them together. So please go ahead, sir. Thank you. I may be slower than like pre industrial per capita growth, but I was a bit confused uh, with like the Harvard discussion and what book needed to be written. Is it like why have we become so rich um, and explaining this evolution? Or is it, why are we so rich today and still not yet in utopia? So let's collect that one and then, okay. did somebody else have a question over here? Did I, did I, was I misreading that? Or maybe I'll add, add a question um, to go and then you can pick and choose how much time you want to spend on all of them. I was just wondering, I wanted to press you about the debate between Bob Gordon and Eric Brynjolfsson in the sense that Bob Gordon sort of argues that a lot of the really big innovations that really advanced living standards like plumbing, sanitation and so on happened in the 1940s and now we're kind of really hitting dimension returns. The sort of one school of thought. And then on the other hand, there's another school of thought, which is the sort of chat, be, chat GPT economic view that sort of artificial intelligence is just on the horizon and we're going to kind of enter this new uh, wave of very rapid technological change. And so I was just kind of curious as your view going forward as to whether we're going to keep growing at 2%, okay. slow or, or accelerate. But, and then any other questions before uh, Brad sort of collects those two together? Yes, one over here. I wanted to ask, uh, the speed of information transfer has grown exponentially since, um, well, let's say, the news of Lincoln, the fascination, took yes. over two weeks to reach England. Mm -hmm. um, today, it could be done in nanoseconds. What impact does that have on uh, economic growth? Uh, and, and uh, equalizing this growth across the uh, Well, I think the answer to the first question is yes, that these are all the questions. Right? The big questions are that you know, once, <coughs> once humanity became settled and became trading, and thus really became an anthology intelligence, you know, especially after the invention of writing when we become an anthology intelligence with memory. It's no longer the case that your knowledge base is what the 50 other members of your band of East African Plains apes know and what they can remember that their parents told them. Um, instead, humanity's knowledge base is everything potentially that has been thought and said as we truly do become an anthology intelligence. And then the big question are, um, as such an anthology intelligence, why is the rate of technological advance so slow or so long? And why does it then speed up so much, you know, so relatively quickly you know, in historical terms? You know, that Michael Kremer back in 1993 had a very nice paper about how really it's just two heads are better than one. And so once you actually get become an anthology intelligence, once you get communicating, you would certainly expect you know, um, a super exponential growth rate. But that is, um, that is belied by first the late antiquity pause, how Eurasian civilization at least seems to fall apart at both ends and in the middle um, after the year 150 for 650 years or so. You know, and back in 1980, Paul Romer and company were expecting a much faster increase um, in the rate of growth of the world economy, simply from spillovers from a much larger community of STEM workers, especially once you added all the people in all the all the smart engineers in poor countries. 
you know, to the mix, um, which did not happen, you know. So, you know, why so slow? Um, given that we are a tremendously effective and competent anthology intelligence. And then why did the breakthrough come in 1870? And why hasn't the breakthrough to levels of material wealth that for us at least, you know, right, that Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, two-thirds god, one-third man, back in 3000 BC, right? Um, Gilgamesh can eat a lot of meat. Gilgamesh can uniquely sit on a wool cushion. Gilgamesh can drink beer, relatively recent invention. Gilgamesh can order lots of people around. But if Gilgamesh even wants kind of cedar wood paneling for his palace, it involves a major military expedition. And in the story, at least, you have to kill a monster um, or two. That his consumption possibilities are quite limited. You know? So unless you really like strenuous exercise, combat, and bossing people around for their own sake, you know, which he does a lot, um, it's not a terribly enriching life. Um, and we leave alone the post-traumatic stress disorder and the existentialist nihilism in which he falls during the middle of the story before becoming wise. Um, that those are the big questions. Um, and you wanted to ask about Gordon versus Brynjolfsson. Well, you know, Gordon's... Gordon's is very much that the structure of technology, the, you know, the structure of potential technologies, was such that in 1870 we hit the sweet spot, you know, the second industrial revolution of technologies, and then invented them and built them out, and that there was nothing like that before or since. You know, one big wave, and that the, old, the we're now not in a Malthusian trap anymore. But, you know, we, we've had the demographic transition. You know, we've become sufficiently less patriarchal. Um, and also infant mortality is now sufficiently low that women no longer think, I've had eight pregnancies, I should try for a ninth because I really need a surviving son. Uh, that's no longer a dominant motive. Um, but, you know, I'm... Um, but he is looking forward to kind of, as Suresh Nadu said yesterday, most things logisticize, and he thinks we have. Yeah, I would say much more that it's not that the second industrial revolution technologies are unique, or uniquely good, right? The steam engine is uniquely good. The railroad is uniquely good. Textile machinery is uniquely good. Machine tools are uniquely good. And then, yes, Simple organic chemistry is good. Petroleum chemistry is good. Petroleum is good. Internal combustion engines are good. Electricity is good. Um, electrical engineering is good. Aviation is good. Electronics are good. But that all of a sudden after 1870, they, it's not that the inventions are bigger. It's that they come much, much, much more quickly without necessarily having to build one on the other. And that seems to me to be a more likely to be the result of a systemic change in human institutions than we simply hit the sweet spot. And then there's the question of what happens next. And there, um, I think Robert confuses technological growth with its value for humanity in that if, if nitrogen fertilizers, so crop yields can go way, way up, so your children are better nourished, so infant mortality falls from 40% because their immune systems are so compromised, they die of the common cold back to five, down to 5%. You know, for every parent, that's such a wonderful and magnificent thing that can be produced by a 50% increase in potential calories available. Well, yeah, for me, if there was something that made food 50% cheaper for me, I would say this is actually the last thing I need. I need food to be more expensive. I really do, not cheaper. And all of my internist yelling at me doesn't compensate for the fact that food is food that there's too much tasty food that is too cheap. Um, someone should do something about this. Um, so that's one thing I think Robert Gordon gets wrong. The other thing is, well, um, we humans arrange atoms in ways that please us and that help us manipulate energy in ways that please us. 
Um, we also acquire knowledge of various kinds of information and use it to kind of decide what to do and we communicate in order to learn things that other people know in order to really participate in this anthology intelligence business and to help us decide what we should do. And so there are really three parts to kind of human economic social life. There's a make and use rival commodities part. There's a build up your knowledge base and make better decisions part. And there's a communicate for organization part. These all three are to some degree fueled by the market economy, but the first with rival goods, we know how the market works, right? That you make something, you're paid for it. And yes, it's worth more to the user than it was to the producer. There is a bunch of surplus there, but you know, user surplus and factor cost are about of the same order of magnitude. But when we get to communication and information goods, you know, what funds them is not that we're paying for what we want and use. What funds them is that we're allowing the producers to rent out our eyeballs and sell them to advertisers, which does have an information function and does have a preference shaping function, et cetera, et cetera. But mostly, if something is being run not on your having to buy a rival commodity that has been made, but instead by, you know, um, Ancillary advertising services, there's no reason to think that the relationship between user surplus and factor cost will be anything like the same. Um, and so the fact that measured real GDP is not going up, um, how could it be going up? Google produces zero final goods and services. And so everything that Google does has a zero in any real national products account. If anything, Google shows up in the NIPA as a productivity decrease. Because now, in addition to making you know, your car or your whatever, you have to pay money to Google to advertise it. Um, that, and that's actually been the case since radio. It, that the whole bunch of human utility, the three hours a day people spent watching network television in the 1960s, that kind of escaped the nas real national income and product accounts fairly completely. Um, and that that's a significant problem with using as our consensus shelling point measure of the productivity of the human economy, something that basically Simon Kuznets designed in the 1930s on the grounds that he wanted something he could compute by himself in his office in three months from readily available government statistics. Then we really should be thinking much harder about that and doing a much better job about that than we are. Thanks, Brett. That's just been a terrific discussion. Please join me in thanking Brett for a wonderful <laughs>